Welcome to the keynote stage. So my name is Mark Walsh. I'm the founder of this conference and part of the leadership team with Daniela and Manel. We have got quite a feast, quite a treat installed for you. The main stage doesn't have all the top names on. Some of them are spread out for various logistical reasons, but there are some awesome presenters on this stage. This stage is also sponsored by Alain Stefani. When we first had the idea of getting sponsors, I basically said, I won't take anyone as a sponsor unless I love what they do, because otherwise it, it doesn't have any integrity for me. I didn't know who Alain Stefani was, but I met her in Berlin. Someone said, oh, she's an intimacy teacher, she's an ex-sex worker, best-selling author in Germany. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll meet her. And I met her, and as soon as I met her, I felt at ease. I felt like, wow, this is a person who's playful, but also a deep listener. This is a, a woman who's a real leader. Uh, since I've seen her work uh, with people in very, you know, around trauma, around intimacy, around very difficult areas, men and women, I've come to regard her as a friend, actually. Like, I love her. So go to her website and check it out. It's Alan, I-L-A-N, Stefani, S-T-E-P-H-A-N for November I, alanstefani.com. There's an offer there called Love and Rage, which is as juicy as it sounds. You'll also find links in the descriptions uh, for the videos below. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Manal. I also thank Daniela uh, for, for holding all that she's been holding um, inside of this work. And I'm really happy to be with you all. Um, so I'm going to be talking about, as Manal just said, the, the double-edged sword of inner awareness when it comes to trauma. And basically, I'm going to be proposing uh, two main things for you inside this session. The first point is that inner awareness, which is just so key around this work around embodiment, that inner awareness can either help or hinder people who are struggling with trauma. It's that double-edged sword component. And then I'm also gonna propose that the more that we understand this dynamic and the map and the particular nuances of it, the more powerful that we are in whatever role that we're in. That could be in our own practice, like it's helpful to know about trauma and inner awareness. Or I know there's gonna be many of you that are holding people one-to-one, -one. maybe you're a meditation or a yoga teacher. I think having that map of trauma is essential. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about. I come at this work from a, a bunch of different angles. And I was trying to, as I was prepping this, I thought, well, how can I explain what I'm up to? So basically my work looks at the relationship between mindfulness, meditation, trauma, the body, and then the social conditions that are shaping our experience of all of those things. That's really what my work is at, what I'm up to in my work. And in this session with you all, my goal, so I'm going to be trying, really trying to download what I found in my research and this topic around inner awareness. And then there will be chances also for questions as well. So I just wanted to mention uh, the chat box is, is up. We got to hear where people are from. So I invite you to be chatting comments, questions. Just want you to know that Manal will also be holding in the host role. There'll be time for you at the end of the session to, to pop in. So I just, I welcome all of those. Yeah. Uh, David, you want to jump in? Wanna jump in here. Uh, yeah. If you have a question for uh, to David, please use the Q and A uh, button because then we could see it. If you put it in the chat and there's so many people putting comments and other questions, it would be very easy to uh, overlook. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yes. The webinar feature is a little different around that. Sometimes the chat's just kind of like off on its own on its own thing. Okay, cool. So. I just, I just want to say transparently, this is such a powerful time to be, I mean, I'm honored to be talking day one uh, about this topic. And it's, it's really powerful time for me to be talking about this work. I'm used to talk to, um, when I'm doing talks like this, to groups of, you know, contemplative teachers, often meditation teachers, could also be yoga. And often I'm talking about why they should care about trauma or the relevance of trauma inside of contemplative work and how they can incorporate best practices. But you know, in this moment, it just feels like the relevance of trauma is so set, it's so here. Whether it's COVID-19, the global pandemic, uh, the impact of climate change. I'm from Canada, but I'm living here in California and just out my door is um, basically a forest and there's been intense fires here in the Bay these months. Um, also here in the US, but I know internationally, just a real um, spotlight on racial injustice and the traumatic impacts of oppression. So it's just a moment where the relevance of trauma is really here. So um, I'm grateful uh, to get to speak into that. 
And there's three components that I want to cover in this session. One is I want to talk about why would it be that inner awareness is a double-edged sword? I mean, most people that I meet, they think, well, it could only be a good thing that people are attending to sensations. So I want to talk about that. Why is it a double-edged sword? I want to talk about some tools uh, that you can use right away because these sessions are so much information. So I'm going to do my best to make this very practical that you can actually take some grounded tools with you. And I also want to support your embodiment practice uh, so that I'm not just sort of a one-way uh, information train with you. So there's going to be some experiential practices, uh, mostly in the second half. And then just a quick disclaimer, just to want to acknowledge that any sessions on trauma can be somewhat evocative, even, even if we're talking about trauma in a somewhat intellectual way. I won't be getting into tremendous details uh, about trauma. I don't think it'll be a super activating session, but just want to invite you to take care of yourself um, in the session and along the way. So let's begin with uh, a brief practice, as I said, around experiential practice. Some of you will be at the end of your days, others here in the US, um, on the West Coast especially, we're at the beginning. So I just wanted to give you a moment to drop into practice and to support your presence as we head into this topic around inner awareness. It'll be just a couple minutes. You can have your eyes open or closed. And if at any point you want to take a break, you're also welcome to do that. I invite you just to take a couple of deeper breaths, again, with your eyes open or closed. Just a more intentional and deeper inhale, and then a slower exhale. Maybe one more here, a deeper breath. Inhale, and then a gentle exhale. You could also notice if there's any kind of touch points in the body that is useful for you to support your presence in your ground. So maybe that's your feet on the ground, or it could be your buttocks in the chair, maybe your hands in your lap, or any other sensations that are helpful to tune into. And I also invite you to notice just what is here for you right now, what's present. That could be your mood. Could also be any thoughts or narratives that you have about this topic. And just taking a moment to check in, notice where you are. This can be helpful for our self-regulation. And then with a breath, just seeing if you can allow that to be here. Whatever you found, whatever's here, that there's some basic agreement with this experience. And then finally, I invite you to offer yourself a gesture of care. So that could be um, a phrase, like good job for being here in this session. Or it could be a, a gesture like a hand on the heart or just a deeper breath, but just taking a moment to extend a little bit of care to acknowledge your presence here. And finally, if you'd like to extend that to anyone else, either here on the call, in your life, other communities, you can do that as well. And then with one more breath, we're going to be shifting here. So anything that will support that, maybe a little bit of gentle movement, one more deeper breath, but just acknowledging that we're going to be shifting here. Okay, thanks everyone. So as we enter into this topic, and as a way to begin, I'm gonna invite you to consider the paths of two different people who are beginning a meditation practice, and they end up having a very different experience. A little bit of context, both of these people are struggling with trauma. And by trauma, I mean that they lived through a traumatic experience that left them feeling helpless, overwhelmed, and profoundly unsafe 
in their bodies. I know we could spend the entire hour talking about definitions of trauma. That's how I'm going to define it right now. This event that leaves us feeling profoundly unsafe in our bodies and often overwhelmed. These two people are also experiencing symptoms of what's known as post-traumatic stress. These are symptoms that carry on after an overwhelming experience. You know, we all, many of us, and the research tells us that over 90% of us, of course, will live through traumatic events. And that doesn't mean that all of us will necessarily experience ongoing symptoms. So some people will experience ongoing symptoms of trauma. This could be things like flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, dysregulating sensations, like suddenly this gripping in the stomach or a feeling I can't breathe. These are the remnants of trauma where it carries on. So we have these two people who um, are struggling and they also, as you might have experienced in your own life or people that you've worked with, there's some desperation for healing. You know, both people are like, I really want to heal. I really want some relief. And they both heard because of the very positive word on the street around meditation, that meditation might be a useful practice. So they both come to meditation. And this is where the path diverges in this visualization. So why do you imagine for a moment the first person has a very positive experience around meditation. They feel empowered by the invitation to pay attention to their inner world. They tune into their breath, their body, and it feels really good for them. They're more able to regulate their emotions. They feel more in control of their lives. Often people experiencing post-traumatic stress, they feel out of control. This person feels more control. And those traumatic reminders start to loosen their grip. And meditation, this practice, becomes a real refuge for this first person. I want you to imagine then this, a, the second person who ends up having a more challenging experience in meditation. So in their first meditation, you can, they could be on an app. They also might be in a meditation group. What happens in the meditation is they go in, they close their eyes, and they end up connecting to traumatic stimuli. And by that, I, could, I mean, this could be sensations that are challenging, intrusive thoughts. And what they do is they try to stick with it. Again, this is a person who's pretty desperate and wants healing and doesn't want, wants to bring their best effort to practice. So they stick with it, but they find themselves more overwhelmed in practice, like they're kind of in a vortex. And they approach, say, a teacher. And the teacher basically says, if you go back to the cushion or if you stay mindful, this tangle that you're in will eventually untangle. Yeah, the holding, will, you'll eventually let go. So basically just stick with practice. They go back to practice. And what happens for this person is they end up feeling more dysregulated, frustrated, and actually they end up feeling quite ashamed. Like they brought the best of their intentions to meditation practice and they ended up somehow making matters worse. So again, with these two people, these two paths who end up in very different experiences. And if you back up from these two people, just as a way to let you know a little bit about kind of the context of how I got into this work, I've been basically studying these two people and really these two paths for about 15 years now. And what I've done in the work is I basically, like my glasses, I was using all of the contemporary, amazing contemporary work, writing and research around trauma treatment to look at meditation practices. So I basically said, what would contemporary trauma teachers and theorists, there's so many amazing people in the conference, what would the field of trauma say about how we tend to practice meditation or even just basic body-centered meditation practices? That was the start of an inquiry. That became a dissertation, became a book, and now I'm teaching about this to many trainers, hundreds and thousands, not hundreds of thousands, hundreds, almost thousands of trainers around the world who are wanting to practice what we could call trauma-sensitive mindfulness. And basically what that means is if you are offering mindful and body-based attentional practices that you know how to work skillfully with trauma. Now, that you can recognize trauma symptoms, 
respond skillfully and prevent re-traumatization in your work, which feels just so important given everything I said about the context of this moment. And the main thing I've learned in all this research that I've done, it won't come as a surprise to many of you given that you're here at an embodiment conference, but it's this, that asking someone to pay close attention to their inner world is a big deal. Now it could be anywhere, again, yoga, meditation, just that turn in, as you might've experienced in your own life or if you're someone who asks people to do that of others, it's a big moment. And my work is to say that is especially big when it comes to trauma. Asking someone who lived through a trauma who might be experiencing symptoms of trauma to go inside is a big deal. And so that is what I'm going to be talking about really for the rest of this whole session is what would you need to know inside of this frame of inner awareness to work skillfully with trauma? And I'd propose that you need to know two things, and then we'll go right into the kind of the, the heart of the topic here. What I feel like you'd need to know, especially if you're someone who's working coach and any kind of leadership you're holding people, but it's also useful in your own practice is, one, what happened to the person who ran into trouble? Like, why did that happen? It's actually quite confusing often. It's like, you'd think meditation would be a quite innocuous practice, but yet this person, I've met so many people that have had difficult experiences. So what happened? And then the second question would be, how is it that we can have more and more people have the positive experience of that first path? That's really the whole point of trauma-sensitive mindfulness work. And I'll be able to cover, I think, a lot of the different components. And this is a massive topic. I just want to acknowledge that. So let me start by addressing that first question. And again, and we might have a chance to stop halfway for some questions that I want to get into practices with you all. So again, I invite you to bring questions in. So let me start with that first question. Well, why did that person run into trouble? We could talk about this for days. But the headline here, and the easiest way I found to describe this, comes in the myth of Medusa. And many of you will know this myth, but if you don't, we have um, Perseus who has been tasked with this um, mission of defeating Medusa, who's this very powerful um, Gorgon. Perseus approach Athena, approaches Athena, goddess of knowledge, and Athena basically says, Medusa is very powerful because if you look directly into Medusa's eyes, you freeze you turn to stone. It's amazing superpower that Medusa has. And Athena says, if you're going to go into Medusa's cave, you need a shield. Now, you can't look directly at Medusa. Peter Levine, who some of you will know, and who's actually, I believe, at this conference, he is a trauma specialist who took this myth inside of a framework called somatic experiencing and said, this myth holds tremendous relevance for people and communities that are struggling with trauma. And basically he said, when you're working with trauma, you can't go directly at it. You can't hyper-focus on elements of trauma that I described earlier, those dysregulating thoughts, those intrusive sensations. He said, if you go directly at trauma, you risk re-traumatization. It's just like Medusa. You're looking directly into Medusa's eyes and you freeze or you turn to stone. So this is, why, this is why a lot of trauma sessions or approaches to trauma treatment, they don't begin with the question, tell me all the details about your trauma. And we, we build up to that. And clients need shields. They need resources they can work with in order to work skillfully with trauma, with the Medusa that ends up living inside them. So why does this matter for us here around inner awareness, around meditation, yoga? What Levine noticed and what so many different trauma specialists have noticed is that people who are struggling with trauma will tend to reflexively orient to Medusa. Uh, they will automatically place their attention on elements of a traumatic experience that they're having in the present moment. Now, if you think about it, this makes, this makes sense around just us protecting our safety. So imagine you lived through a traumatic experience and you become very sensitized to a smell or a location. 
yeah, our brains and bodies are working to actually protect us and have us attune to what could be threatening. This could also be that you attune to elements of a, tra a trauma that live inside your body. So again, if, this pr if someone grew up in an environment where they were quite afraid and they were bracing their lungs, if it's, it's 10 years down the road and they feel those tight lungs, that's important information that they need. So what Levine said is, trauma survivors, people struggling with trauma, will reflexively orient their attention to trauma, just like Medusa, and they need tools, they need a shield. So with that said, I just want you to imagine for a moment the setup inside of contemplative practice when it comes to trauma. So imagine like the second person you're coming to meditation with symptoms of trauma, flashbacks, intrusive thoughts, dysregulating sensations. You sit down on a cushion, you enter into practice. And of course, you will naturally pay attention to what is dysregulating. You could think about times in your own life that this has happened. Of course, your attention is going to go towards trauma or what is stirring and dysregulating. Now, what I wanna to say to all of you is, that's not automatically a bad thing. Mindfulness will often reveal places that were contracted, places that were traumatized. But if someone doesn't know that they can back off, that there's this issue of Medusa, that they could take a break, or that there's this dynamic here, they can run into a lot of problems inside of a contemplative practice. Again, whether yoga, meditation, people will just continually bring their attention to a traumatic experience and they can end up dysregulated and at worst re-traumatized. And a lot of the people, this is who I want to give voice to, to all of you on this talk. So many of the people I met end up feeling ashamed. You know, they're bringing the best of intentions to their practice and yet they end up making things, feeling like they're making things worse. They end up feeling broken, but actually what they needed is they just needed something more. So that's where I wanna go for the rest of this session is I wanna talk about, well, what is that more that people need? And doing so, I wanna shift then to this second question of like, well, how do we have more people have positive experiences when they're paying attention internally? And the headline here is around tools. Yeah, we, we need to give people tools. I just got to do an interview with um, Sharon Salzberg. Some of you will know her. Um, quite well-known Buddhist teacher, really well-known for her work around loving kindness. And Sharon was doing work last year with survivors, uh, families actually, who were survivors of um, gun violence and mass shootings here in the US. And she was in a retreat environment with people who had really experienced um, quite significant trauma. She said the word that kept coming up was tools. Yeah, Mindfulness, meditation, it was one tool. You know, there were many other tools that people could employ. And that's what's so important when it comes to trauma. So why tools? Why would you need tools? A couple different reasons, then we'll actually get right into the tools. People who are struggling with trauma are often experiencing something known as dysregulated arousal. We have, a, one of the metaphors here is we all have an accelerator and a brake in the nervous system and with trauma, we can have the experience that both of these pedals remain slammed to the ground. So what people need are tools to actually self-regulate, yeah, to come back into what's known as an optimal window of tolerance. When I do this training for others, we go deeper into the window of tolerance. But people need tools to actually self-regulate. All of you here who are watching this, you will have multiple tools that you employ to self-regulate we can have ones that are specifically tailored to mindfulness and meditation. And that's where I'm gonna be going here. So um, I'm gonna open it up here. Manal, I'm gonna head right into the tools here, but because I'm not tracking the chat, I just wanted to pause and see if there's any you know, burning clarifying questions or anything that you wanna jump in with before I head on to the actual, the tools. Yeah. Not a, um, there are questions, but we could leave them at the end, but a lot of yeses and uh, thank you for saying that. And it makes so much sense. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Awesome. This is a, you know, it's quite a, it's a unique and specialized topic. And I do meet people. There's often one person in the audience or more 
who says, oh, that's what was happening for me or for a client. You know, so I just, I'm grateful for you all being here. Thanks, Manal. So let's talk about tools. And then we'll get into some practice here, which is what I really want to do. So first tool I want to offer, and again, this is in the context, I'm going to be offering this specifically around meditation. But you could think about this of any practice when we are inviting people or ourselves, we're practicing, inviting people into contact with their inner world, yeah, that we're inviting them to shift really from thinking down to feeling. And inside of meditation, the first tool that I recommend is making sure that people know how to hit the brakes. Uh, this metaphor comes from uh, a trauma specialist named Babette Rothschild. And she's awesome. She wrote the book called The Body Remembers. And she said, if we're going to do any work around traumatic stress, which in this moment historically, you know, in any room that we're in, to me in all likelihood, there'll be a number of people who are struggling with trauma, often just under the surface. Yeah, we don't, we don't always know. But that said, we need to make sure people know how to hit the brakes or said in another way, how to modulate the intensity of an embodied practice. So the story Babette tells is she, um, she was the first person in her small town to, or in her group of friends to get a, a driver's license. And so she would take her friends to the parking lot to, to drive the car. And she said, the first thing that was so important was ensuring that her friends knew where the brake was. Now, if we're going to be in the car, it's dangerous. Where's the brake? It's the first thing you got to know. She said, same thing with trauma. And it's especially true for the reasons I just said about Medusa that people know how to modulate the intensity of practice. I cannot tell you the number of people I meet who in their attempt to be a good student or that they just wanna, of course they're, they're hurting, they wanna bring, they wanna follow instructions. This could be partly this issue of compliance, but really saying like, let me do the practice. They don't know always that there are options inside of practice that would help support those, their self-regulation. So here's a couple of what will seem like obvious examples, but I think it's worth saying right up front. So inside of a guided meditation, for example, letting people know they can open their eyes. At any point, your eyes closed, you've probably had this experience, your eyes are closed, that can intensify an experience, especially if you're having flashbacks. So letting people know just gently, if at any point during the meditation, you'd like to open your eyes, orient to your surroundings, you're welcome to do that. Another one is shifting posture. Again, surprising, but a lot of people will have ideas about a practice. Well, I need to stay in this posture. I can't move. If I move, then I'm not strong or I'm not going to get it. So inviting people, hey, if at any point you want to shift your posture, you need to stand up, you need to lie down, you're welcome to do that. Now, I want to pause here and say, I'm not advocating for avoidance. It doesn't mean that any kind of inner awareness practice needs to just have people be comfortable. On the contrary to me, you know, mindfulness is about building this muscle and this capacity to be with difficulty, to be with the, the, the fluctuations of our experience. And there can be moments where actually backing off will serve someone's self-regulation and keep them in practice. It will enable them to cultivate that inner awareness. So opening your eyes, shifting posture, taking breaks, another obvious one, but an important one, maybe, or maybe you want to do a shorter meditation to be useful. And then the breath, breath can also be helpful. Now, not for everyone, but having someone take uh, four deep breaths and you know, we have the four count, four count in, pause, four count out. Breath can be very useful for self-regulation as well. So those are some examples of hitting the brakes. You can continue to just cultivate that, the, that tool for you. But what are the different modifications that you can offer people or that you can practice yourself that helps modulate the intensity of practice? That's number one. The second um, practice, and then we're going to have some we'll practice here, is about providing choice. And this is key for those of you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, trauma-sensitive or trauma-informed work, which is being applied in so many different domains. But when it comes to trauma-informed work, offering people choice and agency is key. You know, for um, trauma survivors, people live through trauma, choice is often taken away, whether that's in the moment 
of a traumatic experience, or it could be because of those ongoing symptoms. Like, I just don't feel like I'm in choice. I had a client who said, you know, it feels like I'm in the passenger seat of a car that I'm just not in control of because of my trauma. So what we can do in our practice and when we're offering inner awareness practices to others is to be just pow- like giving people powerful options that instills a sense of choice and agency in their work. One of the simplest ways we can do this inside of meditation is to actually provide alternate anchors or objects of attention. Some of you will have known this. I know I didn't when I first heard this and it was very useful. So often the breath is the place that we will focus our attention inside of practice. And it's a place of stability, a place that we can anchor our attention. And then when the mind wanders into thought, which it inevitably does, we can bring our attention back to this anchor. That could be sensations of the breath, the nostrils, or the rising and falling of the abdomen. But the breath isn't always neutral for people struggling with trauma. So we could talk about this for quite a while. It might come up in the Q&A. Our respiratory system is connected to our sympathetic nervous system, which is connected to traumatic stress. So when you ask someone to pay attention to their breath, you may be putting them right in front of Medusa. Now, not everyone. The breath is, of course, it's very useful for many people. But you can also offer choices around anchors. So I'd like to offer you a couple um, inside of practice. So let's, it's going to be an optional practice here because I'd like you, I'm going to guide you through, let's say, um, three different anchors here. And I want you to get to experience these different anchors. Again, completely optional practice. um, But invite you to find a posture here for the next about three, four minutes that will support your attention, help you feel both relaxed, but also somewhat alert. And then you can have your eyes open or closed here, whatever will help you connect with these different anchors. And the first anchor that I'm going to invite you to connect with is sound. So for a moment, allow your attention to go towards hearing, if that's available to you. Like what's in your soundscape? You could label any of the sounds that you hear, or you could also just be present with the experience of hearing. And letting this for a moment be an anchor of attention, meaning that if your mind drifts into thought, just gently see if you can bring it back to hearing. Noticing what this anchor is like for you. Is it an easier anchor? Is it more difficult? And then I'm gonna invite you to shift attention to a second anchor, and that will be sensations somewhere in the body besides the breath. So that might be the feeling of your feet touching the ground or maybe your buttocks in the chair, could be your shoulders, whatever you'd like to focus your attention on in terms of sensations. And then just let this be a second anchor for a moment. Notice if it's easier or harder to rest your attention here. And the quality of relationship that you have with this anchor. Again, as a resting place to cultivate attention. And then finally shifting to a third anchor here, which will be the breath. Again, that could be sensations connected to the rising and falling of the abdomen or the chest or the breath in and out of the nostrils. And just letting your attention gently rest with these different anchors connected to the breath, whatever you choose. And again, noticing the quality of relationship with this anchor 
Is it easier? Is it more difficult? And then finally in the practice, just noticing if you had to choose one of these anchors to work with for the next, say, 20 minutes in a practice, which would you choose? And just knowing that for yourself can be useful information. And then in the next few breaths, I'm gonna invite you to shift out of this practice. So whatever will support that. You can stay with the anchor if you want as I continue to talk or you can let that go. Okay. So that's a tool, second tool that I wanted to offer, offering different anchors of attention that people can work with, building in that choice right from the start. One brief caveat is um, I encourage you not to barrage people with choices. And I say that as someone, you know, as a Canadian who, yeah, I, I don't want to make people feel too uncomfortable. So when I first started doing this, I started to offer multiple choices. Like you can have your eyes open or closed or downcast or you know, whatever you want. It would just kind of tail off instead of actually saying you can have your eyes open or you can keep them closed or downcast, like giving people one or two different choices. We want to find the balance here of offering choice and giving agency back to people while still holding a container. We want people to feel that we are still with them. Okay, so that's number two. And I have two more that I'd like to cover, and then we're going to open it up um, for some questions here. So again, encourage you, comments, questions, please keep them coming. And Manal, if there's anything burning, you're always welcome to, to jump in here. So, so okay, two more. Um, I'd like to offer you, I wouldn't call this a parlor trick, but this is, when I first saw this, I thought, how can this be so useful? But this comes from someone named uh, Timothy, Timothy Goddard in Australia, who'd been a mindfulness teacher for 25, 30 years actually. And, and when I asked her, I said, what is your go-to self-regulation practice that you offer people who are experiencing dysregulated arousal? Maybe it's related to trauma or not, but what do you, how do you help people? And she said, oh, this is my go-to. So I found this very useful and it's useful for reasons that I'll unpack in a moment, but it has to do with um, using your hands in coordination with your breath. So I'm gonna be guiding you through this practice for just a minute here. If at any point this feels dysregulating or you wanna back off, you're welcome to. I'm gonna have my hands here so you can see me, but you can have them down um, in your lap. You don't need to have them <laughs> up, in, up in the screen. So for a moment, actually you can have your hands down for a moment, just tune your attention inward and notice the quality of your breath for a moment. Again, if that feels too dysregulating, you can back off. I'd like you to notice the kind of the pace and the quality of the breath. And letting that be a baseline. Now what I'd like you to do is you can have your hands, again, in your lap, you don't need them up here. And the invitation is to expand and contract your hands with the expansion and contraction of your lungs. So it's coordinated. So it'd be something like inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. And you can just match to the pace of whatever would feel supportive for you right now. If you want some deeper inhales, you can let your hands go a little further, exhaling. You could also have your hands actually going up and down, but just this little toggling, yeah. Inhale, gentle exhale. Whatever pace, whatever depth of breath, feels best for you right now. And then finally, just notice wherever you wanna place your attention. Would you like to attend to the feeling of the hands or maybe just the breath? Or maybe it's the breath and the hands that you're oscillating attention between those two. Whatever will support you here right now. Okay, just one more. Okay, thank you all. I can let that go. 
I have found that practice as simple as it is to be very helpful for people who are feeling dysregulated, especially if they're more um, hyper aroused, meaning that there's an intense amount of physiological arousal in the nervous system. One of the reasons this works so well with trauma is gets back to Medusa. If we're just asking people to attend to the breath, that can be locking them into dysregulation, that that vortex, it's too much. By giving, them, by giving someone this hands, it offers us a different reference point for our attention. Sometimes the extremities also hold less charge emotionally for us to focus our attention. So we could actually focus our attention outside on the hands, then toggle back and forth between um, the hands and the breath. It can be very useful practice. Uh, one thing I don't have time to get into here is also working with external anchors. There's ways that people s might say, you know what, paying attention to anything internally is too much. I can pay attention to that tree outside my window. So I have a whole, I don't have the time to get into it here, but we can also have a whole um, branch of work around external anchors. So I'm gonna offer one more tool and then we'll, we'll open it up here. And the final tool is actually, um, it's actually about embodiment. And it comes back to how it is that we show up in our practice and with others. And if I was to summarize the tool, it would be about um, respecting trauma, you know, respecting people's survival strategies and having deep care and curiosity about the lives that they've lived. Some of you might've heard this, but um, one of the shifts with trauma-informed care is often from what's the matter with you or what's wrong with you to what happened to you, a deeper curiosity that we can embody. So I want to um, offer you a brief practice, it's an embodiment practice about how I experience having this level of care and respect for trauma and for the trauma that people have lived through. And this practice comes from a teacher I know named Stacy Haynes, who's with Generative Somatics, and also through Hakomi Therapy, which some of you will know. It's a body-based approach. But um, here's what I'd like you to do. Just to note, this can be sometimes a somewhat evocative practice. So um, be gentle with yourself here. And if at any point you'd like to back off, you're welcome to. But there's going to be two parts to this practice. And the first part is to um, make a fist. Again, I'm gonna have it here so you can see, but you can have it down your lap. And I'd like you to imagine that the job of this fist is to stay closed. And in staying closed, this fist is taking care of your safety. Uh, that's its job. And then for the first part of this practice, what I'd like you to do with the other hand is try to pry open the fist and actually give yourself the embodied experience of how does it feel to try to pry open the fist when its job is to stay closed, to keep us safe. Just feel that for a moment. Notice what happens in the body, the breath. Okay, then you can let that go. You can shake it out if you want. And then the second part of this practice, same thing. You'll have your hand in, in this clenched, taking care of your safety. And then what I'd like you to do, the invitation is with the other hand, place uh, a certain amount of care, presence, and love into this hand, like uh, the respect that I was talking about. And then the invitation is to place this hand beneath the fist that's closed. And in doing so, it's almost like you're communicating uh, something like good job, or um, of course you are holding, of course you are. That's so smart. And I have no agenda for you to open here. I'm just here and I'm present, I'm with you. You could even support the fist for a moment with your own hand, like I'm gonna help you close. And then just noticing how that impacts you. How does it impact your breath, your mood? And then 
I'll invite you to slowly let that go. And then maybe with a breath or two, just checking in, noticing how you are after that practice. If you'd like to jot any notes down, you're welcome to. You're also, I totally encourage you to share into the chat about how that was for you. And then I'm going to end here with a, a story about this uh, as we open it up. So again, this, this fourth tool is about respecting trauma and really respecting the survival strategies that people have that keeps them safe. I was in a, I was in a small meditation group uh, pre-COVID. Uh, I was in a residential area and it was you know, a small group of us. And at the end of the meditation, the, the teacher did a go around. So I just wanna know how that meditation was for you. And one of the people in the group said, I honestly, I, I hated that. I wanted to run from this meditation. It was really challenging for me. And it was a moment, you know, everyone got kind of quiet, like, oh, how's this gonna go? And I looked at the teacher and what I noticed is that the teacher took a breath, seemed like they felt their back, and they said, great, thanks for sharing that. Can you share more about that? They got curious, they didn't personalize it and go, oh, wow, I must have led a poor meditation. And the person started talking and then the teacher said, well, do you know, you said you wanted to run away. How far away would you wanna go? And the person was surprised and they said, well, you know, there's a hill outside the road. I'd wanna to go to the top of that hill. And the teacher said, well, do you, do you wanna go there now? You're welcome to do that. Maybe you could bring a, a buddy from the group. And the person said, wow, okay. So they went and for about five or seven minutes they left and they came back in and I'll never forget this they had this look on their face of aliveness, of, of a deep embodiment. They looked happy, they were kind of flushed. And we had to say, what happened? And they said, well, they ran wind sprints up this hill and they actually choked up. And they said, I just wanna thank you for trusting my body and trusting that I know what I needed. And that to me is an embodiment of trauma-sensitive mindfulness. And when I, when I think about this example of the fist, it was like, okay, you know, I'm going to provide a container. It wasn't just like, you know, you can run away, do whatever you want. I want you to come back, but I'm still going to trust. I'm going to have a fundamental trust in one's physiology. And this is what I think is so important around trauma. If we're asking people to attend to their inner world, we have to have a deep trust in what's lying under the surface. And that that's the embodiment that we can have like a deep respect for what people have lived through and what they're bringing into any practice that we're in. So I'm gonna pause there and um, I'm gonna open it up to Manal if you wanna jump in. I have not been tracking the chat because I've been trying to be present yeah. here. So if we have well, time for questions, I'd love to chat we, with anyone. We have, we have a time for questions. And the Great. cool thing about the Q&A button that people could vote uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the question that they wanna answer. So I'll give people to, a minute to look at it because I, I wanted just to share but with you what what's happening in the chat especially with the last exercise with the fist Please. with the with the with, when it was the first time you're trying to force there were comments of stopping of breath and you know anxiety and, and, and many other uh, reactions like that but with the second one uh, of cradling the hand there's, you know, uh, such a release, such uh, tears coming down, a lot of um, open and uh, easy feelings that were coming. And a lot of people mentioned it was a very powerful um, exercise. So um, thank you for that. Oh, wow, I am, <laughs> okay. So here's the, uh, a question that has <laughs> 59 likes so 60 oh, okay, <laughs> okay so, yeah. I better not mess this one up so let's let's uh, get on with that one how can one self-regulate in a traumatizing triggering environment and I also want to link it with another question um was about you know um shock there's um um a question about people from Lebanon who experienced that, you know, big explosion, how to yeah. shield from that. So I, I think there's, those two questions are linked in a way. So if you can answer both at the same time. Do we have another hour? 
<laughs> we, could, we could all just hop into the room together. Uh, wow. Wow. Okay. So I'm going to answer that in two, two parts. Um, and I think this will hopefully speak to all of that. Let me ask, let me answer part one as a, as a, with a quick story. And I have just a deep Lebanon. I actually have been working with a couple people doing mindfulness work in Lebanon and just the intense traumatic experience that continues really with the footage. Um, a teacher of mine, Stacey Haynes, tells a story of being on a street corner and seeing a family about to cross the street. And uh, it was a, a caregiver with two children and entered into the street and a car went through a red light and the, the, the caregiver had to pull the child back quite quickly as probably a four or five year old and you know, kind of yanked them off the street. And my friend was watching and said that the, the child started to cry and had an understandable was shaking because it was really scary. That was a really intense traumatic experience or a potentially traumatic. And she said, what happened in the moment and with no shame of that caregiver, the caregiver said, stop, you need to stop. Because I think the caregiver was so freaked out and said, I can't be with this emotion that's here. And so as you can imagine, what happened is the kid who's trying to stay connected ended up kind of clamping the jaw, getting quite tight. Now, that's a kid who's quite resilient, and I'm sure that they were able to move through it. But if that happens enough times, that can create certain patterns and, and um, contractions in the body. So in answer to the question around shock trauma, to me, it's about, it's about a deep, deep respect for what the body needs to do, and ideally a container for how one can move that level of activation through the body. So perhaps if that caregiver, again, with no shame to the caregiver, that is, makes sense, if they had have actually brought the child aside and said, that was scary, it's okay if you need to cry, that's shaking that's happening, that's okay. You know, that's ideally what we as humans need is that space to be able to let that charge run through the body. So that's my first answer is shock trauma. The second about self-regulation, what can we do? I can't, I mean, that's to me, that is it. I invite you, I think this whole conference will be about the many tools that we need to self-regulate. Dance, there's so many amazing teachers here who will be coming at that question from a thousand different angles. My work, you know, these tools here are about meditation. But what I'd say is I'd encourage all of you to really take stock and say, what works for me? What are the tools that I need? And then build that. And, you know, my big work is that it's not, it not everything's not, we're not a, what is the expression? We're not a hammer and everything's not a nail. We need the technical bits. We need the many practices. So find the ones that work for you. A walk, a break, resilience, connecting with a friend. So I could go on, but... That's what I'd say. I keep coming back to the conference. Dance and movement. I see that chat in here. So, Thank you so much, David. And I, there's so many really good questions. We're, we're come, we came to the, you know, the end of the session. And uh, it's just uh, a lot of uh, things that we can't possibly cover. Definitely. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, being here. I... Uh, I want to remind everyone that the you know the session is as oh uh, up for free for forty hours. After that, um, you know we have uh, there's the coffee breaks that you could find them on the portal under uh, my conference, and you could you know chat and maybe connect with other people uh, at the conference. Uh, the Facebook group is where a lot of uh, chats and discussions happen. So please uh, join that. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, Ilan Stefani is the sponsor for the keynote um, sessions. And uh, we have um, David's um, website and, and links. If, oh, good. You know, if it gets messed up with, that, with the chat, it's on the portal. You can go back. Yeah, uh, come, come, come. There's a newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could you could find uh, that on on his section. And if you like this session, and I absolutely love it, so I'll, I'll thank you very much, David, for this. You can own the library. You could buy, you know, the channel, uh, the each channel, or you could buy the whole thing. So you can come back to it anytime you'd like. 
and you know watch other things on your uh, own time and we appreciate it it really helps us make this um happen and it enables a lot of people uh access it um so yeah coming up we will have on this channel uh, an overview of the speakers so if you want to know who's coming up and a little bit more about them uh please uh stay tuned or check the other channels and before we head out david um what is your you know one or one small sentence what is embodiment to you or any tip about embodiment yeah i think it's the hand it's that practice is the um, the body opens with a with a yes and so to combat that respect of trauma i think is so key for all of our for us not just who people were leading just for us too so that's what i would end with and just a deep thank you for everyone that's here uh it's, it was a real honor to get to be here and thank you both for hosting as well that's awesome the body opens with yes i i love that and um thank you so much uh for being here and I, that's a lovely thing to end this beautiful session and there's a lot of thank you and love coming your way oh, uh in the chat so um thank you so much and uh everyone um we'll see you in the next session mm -hmm.